Good evening from the Commonwealth Club of California. I am Dr. Robert Kilpatrick, the chair of the Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum here. And uh, we are uh, online now during this pandemic. Tonight's program and the club's new virtual efforts are generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. Well, we have a wonderful program tonight, uh, part of our Healthy Society series. The title is Healthier Rural America Toward a Better Future. And we have three uh, excellent speakers who are experts in their field, beginning with Dennis Behrens, who's the former president of the National Rural Health Association and the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health and he was actually born and raised on a farm in Nebraska. Uh, Dr. Stephen Shortell, professor of the Graduate School and distinguished uh, professor emeritus with prime appointment in the School of Public Health, University of California, Berkeley. And our moderator tonight is Dr. Philip Polikoff, who is the CEO and founder of Healthier We. He's a consulting professor at Stanford University School of Medicine and the organizer of the Healthier Rural West Summit. So without further ado, welcome, Phil. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club and thank you to the Commonwealth Club community for inviting us to participate in the Healthier Society series. Our interactive virtual conversation will be on the subject of a healthier rural America towards a better future. Appreciation to my colleagues and friends, Dennis Behrens and Steve Shortsell for their bringing their expertise to us uh, and to engage in a give and take conversation with you. And most important, thank you to all the people who have turned in for this conversation. And we want to hear from you with questions and thoughts. For all of us, there is no question these are challenging times regardless of where you reside, rural America, urban America, and beyond. Before the start of 2020, there is no question that local, state, national, and global infrastructure problems existed from all perspectives. However, they did need a significant amount of rebuilding or new building at that time. Since January 2020, I'm sure you agree, pre-existing problems have only gotten significantly worse on multiple fronts due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, which is truly worldwide. And this has highlighted what I would call the six P's. One would be the issue of personal health. One would be the issue of population health. One would be the issue of public health. One would be the issue of uh, political will. The fifth one would be place. And the sixth one would be prosperity. With that, we also have social injustices, which certainly have been well-documented and felt profoundly at this time over the last 10 days, but certainly pre-existed this period of time, documenting the lack of equity and equality. In essence, both and, not either or. So where we're at now is we're at a mission critical. We have to turn the moment at this moment into momentum, moving from poverty and illness to prosperity and health. In this conversation, we'll focus on rural America. Keep in mind, about 60 million people live in rural America, which represents about 80 to 90 percent of the geography of this country. If we look at historically, we can look to the five F's when we talk about rural America. They embrace food, fuel, fiber, finance, and family. And keep in mind, change comes slowly in rural America. Relationships are critically important, and all of this has to be dealt with in a way that we can see meaningful momentum going forward. So let me give you three words in two sets. For us to accomplish the mission of tonight and beyond, we have to engage change. We have to be committed to transformation. 
And we do have to find the next generation of leadership. And this gets manifested in three P's. We have to make sure that our policies have texture to them that are meaningful. We have to make sure the politics are moving from the past to the future, not red and blue. And we also have to have practicality. So we have to have real life examples of what's going on and tell stories. Let me just share for a moment a little bit about who Phil Polikoff is. I think it's important that everyone knows the story behind, besides the identification that Robbie was so kind to give me. As a teenager in the 60s, I worked on a dairy farm and I was involved in social activism. As a young physician, I was a commissioned service officer in the US Public Health Service. And with that, I went throughout this country and saw a lot of the issues that are still there today. I went to the farms and saw pesticide poison. I went to the meat processing plants and I saw the whole issue of infections. I went into the mines and saw coal miner issues of pneumoconiosis, or I went to see asbestosis in the shipyard workers. So we saw that over the last decade, and that's what brings us to tonight. We've really been dedicated, a group of us, to looking for a healthier rural America across sectors, not just in the health care sector but as it pertains to all the other sectors, which we would define as social determinants. So before I turn it over to my colleagues, I'd like to just give you a little foundation on rural, uh, a healthier rural America. One, let's go back in time to 1948, when the World Health Organization put forth its definition of health. It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And boy, in rural America and throughout America, we really haven't addressed uh, mental health and social well-being as much as we've addressed physical illness. More recently, we've used one line, which we think we capture as a spirit. In these times, if I is replaced by we, even illness becomes wellness. Only working together are we going to see changes for the better going forward. So when we look at rural health, from two perspectives, the traditional health model, we see that traditionally people are thought to be sicker, older, and poorer. We see that they have less care. We see that there's a higher rate of chronic disease. We see that there's more problems with opiate and substance abuse, as well as alcoholism. And we see that the health delivery system is short as far as efficiency and effectiveness. Over the last 10 years, there's been 120 or more hospitals closed. That includes additional nursing homes and clinics and the like. Finances are tough. Recruiting workforce is challenging at all levels, whether it's from the community health worker through the um, nature of the specialist. However, we also have to worry about the other social determinants that enter into the equation. In rural America, we look at the income is generally about $10,000 a year less. The education is much lower standard. There's fewer people going on to college. Employment, high rate of unemployment and high rate of un inability to get new jobs moving into the area. We also have housing. There's a shortage of low rental properties and transportation is tough. Getting from A to B for healthcare or for anything else can be a couple hours. And there's a shortage of emergency medical services going there. And lastly, before I turn it over, there's food insecurity. We all thought that this is the bread basket. Turns out that a lot of the people in rural America don't have the greatest nutrition, have a shortage of food, and they're challenges. So with that, hopefully that sets the scene for us collectively, my colleagues, to share their perspectives. We're open for questions as we go forward. And we're looking to take tonight and move it forward. And I, once again, want to commend the Commonwealth Club for the Healthy Society series. So with that, let me turn it over to Denny Behrens, who has a lengthy history of being from Nebraska and dealing with the entire rural America from the ground. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, Commonwealth Fund. Uh, so you heard some of my story. Each of you have a story as well. And what I'd like to suggest is we have to spend a lot more time finding the real stories of rural. Phil gave you the WHO definition of health. Let me give you mine, which I've used for probably 20, 30 years. And it's very simply, health is when everything works. And as I get older, that makes even more sense. 
Ruralness is very challenging because right now there are a lot of myths. There's a lot of hidden numbers. There's a lot of classifications. The big issue between rural and urban I have discovered over many years of living in rural is the lack of anonymity in rural creates a whole different texture of life, very different than urban. As Phil said, we got 70, maybe close to 80% of our population now living in urban centers. Where did most of our families originally come from? Where did they first settle in the United States? Most of us have some rural story in our background. My understanding of what that means is that we're all imprinted in some ways with a rural perspective. And that, I think, is one of the reasons we have such a hard time addressing the rural myths that we share with each other. The other big deal for me is that words matter. I, Phil and I have talked about this, and he, yeah, all the things he said about rural seems to be true. But is rural really older, poorer, sicker than urban? Or are we simply trapped in the negative frames that most of us who live in urban use all the time. These negative fr frames and paradigms, I think need to stop being used because they don't help. And there's no place in America that I've been that has remained unchanged in the last 50 years. The other thing I think is very evident today, and it certainly is evident around rural, is that the past ideas that we operated under were often wrong. And now we even struggle with our ability to see all people as having importance in our world. Rural is the original social distancing model and the original work at home model. For me, the definition of rural boils, boils down to two words. It's either altitude or attitude. Do you fly over us? Do you drive through us? Or do you actually take time and learn about the rural people and the feelings they have about being in a rural area? The USDA Economic Research Service has given at least 20 definitions of rural. I use many of them to write grants from. What it doesn't understand is that there's very high technology being used in personless equipment, in most of the major rural areas that I've been in, there's high-tech marketing, there's genetic utilization. This attracts young people, as well as a lot of 30 and 50-year-olds. And most of us have been thinking, well, we've lost 30 and 50-year-olds from rural. But Ben Winchester, rural sociologist from the University of Minnesota, said in the last 20 to 30 years, 90% of all rural counties in the United States have actually experienced gains in that population. Another myth that's out there was dispelled by the CEO of Land O'Lakes Land last week when I heard her say, 96% of all the farms in America right now are actually still family owned in one form or another. The other thing that you probably are not aware of if you don't live and operate in rural areas is that there's a lot of movement right now towards rural partnerships. I think most of us never thought we'd see the day, but they're here, they're happening, they're at various stages, and the key, as Phil mentioned, is leadership. It comes in many forms and often different forms in rural than in, in urban centers. So leadership is the key, and it's a key at all levels. In small rural, it looks more like a cooperative model because all the citizens usually have to pitch in to get whatever needs to be done, done. And it happens because of relationships that exist. Leaders have to be focused on accountability. They have no choice because of the lack of anonymity. But they also have to be flexible and they have to be innovative. If we do this right, I've long stated that we could actually have a rural renaissance. But it'll take a new paradigm, one that looks less like a box or a silo, which has vertical integration or a hub and spoke model, and it'll look more like a web. It could be digital, but I like the spider web analogy because it's organic, it's well-built, it's flexible, it's easily adapted to change, especially change that comes about as the environment around us shifts. So what's needed? Well, we need the real rural stories to show us 
what happens in society with our structural issues. That comes out of the stories we hear from each other. And it's the way that then we can begin to work together. The rural voice must be heard. It must drive all of us as we work to help each other, especially rural citizens, to enhance their communities. You must work with and not alone in silos when you work with rural. Their healthier future is their future, and we collectively need to help them achieve it. We need to hear from them what the many system issues are in healthcare and beyond that need to be addressed. We need to encourage them to build systems that will work for them and not always impose them from the outside. The corporatization model that took over America and was really prevalent in rural removed most of the diversity and we're seeing the price we have to pay because that diversity has been limited. So begin with us to envision a new healthier rural America. I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Shortell for his thoughts on these issues as well. Steve. Thanks Denny and hello everyone. And my comments will build on uh, many of uh, Denny's and I'll give some concrete examples and suggestions say a little bit about the background of myself as well. I grew up in rural Wisconsin, first eight years of my life. I uh, was born in a little community called New London. The nearest city I think is probably Appleton. Uh, and then we moved to a little community called Norwalk in southwest Wisconsin, maybe 30 miles from La Crosse. My father was the principal of the one school in the area. It would be from first grade all the way on up to uh, high school. And uh, sadly, in 1953, my mother came down with polio, both the spinal and the bulbar, year or so before the salt vaccine. Uh, perhaps if she had had a little quicker care, she wouldn't have had to uh, stay in an iron lung for the nine months she did, St. Francis Hospital across Wisconsin. She survived, thankfully. We moved to California. She needed to get to a dry climate. And I still remember when we left in our car in July or June, it was of 1953, uh, the population of that little community went down from 500 to 495. And the elementary school that I attended uh, in the suburb of Los Angeles was about twice as many students in that school than we had in all of this little rural community that I came from in Wisconsin. Uh, I will also say that as uh, an educator, I've had a number of my students who've gone into rural health policy and management. Uh, Denny may remember perhaps Tim Size, who was uh, involved with the National Rural Health Association and a student of mine when I was at the University of Chicago. And I've had colleagues that actually uh, have started rural health centers and do work on rural health policy and research. So let me build on what uh, Phil and, and Denny have said and make a few points at this stage that we can come back to later on. First of all, the point made about, we're talking about rural health, not the healthcare system only. The fact that about 60% of our health in this country worldwide are what's called the social determinants. And they are our education and housing, our zip code, where we're born and so on. And if we're going to improve rural health, we need policies, partnerships, structures, mechanisms that are going to make very permeable the relationship between the delivery system in rural America and these other kinds of systems that exist in rural America. One concrete example, the area agencies on aging. There's a number of them across the country, 51% of them are in rural areas and they are connected for our older population in rural areas to, uh, co to connect them to the kinds of resources that build and maintain their health outside of perhaps the local rural hospital or primary care provider or nurse practitioner. Uh, we need to create accountable communities for health that exist in rural America with linkages as needed to the urban uh, America as well. Uh, I'm beginning to call these and others whole person development centers that look at the educational housing food needs that contribute to health in addition to the healthcare system. 
So this is a set of policies perhaps we can come back to. Secondly, turning to the delivery system itself, absolutely we need to push for universal health insurance coverage. COVID-19 has made that just embarrassingly clear in terms of what's happening to people that do not have that kind of coverage and going forward. And we need to couple that with a different way in which we pay for health care in this country. We need to totally get rid of the fee-for-service system and move towards global budgets of one form or another. Risk-adjusted capitation, you're likely to be in the short run multi-payer. It can be done. We're not going to get to single payer in the short run. You can do it with multi-payer. We can argue about what the budget should be between insurers and providers. We can argue about risk adjustment, but create an incentive to keep people well in rural America, in urban America, much like Kaiser Permanente, and they're not the only ones, have done for years. That creates the incentive and predictability of revenue and resources for rural America and urban America to innovate, to make sure that telehealth visits remain after COVID-19 begins to mitigate, right? That this is a way that's acceptable and can increase access to care for people in rural America and in urban America as well. Give you a concrete example, come back to it, Intermountain Healthcare, Salt Lake City, Utah, provides care in rural states, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, they're reaching out to other states as well, uh, have about 500 caregivers on call in terms of telehealth. And increasing, they, they're using that and they increase the ability of people living in rural areas to get specialty consultations. One example of a young child born with a hole in his lung that normally they would have transferred into urban, you know, with a two, three hour bus ride or whatever, helicopter, probably through telehealth, specialty consult was able to be dealt with in the small rural hospital with follow-up care in the rural community, saving not only a lot of inconvenience, but as my numbers recall, about $18,000 alone in helicopter costs. It's that kind of innovation that when you pay for wellness, you begin to get incentives for innovation. And the last thing I think I'll, I'll say now that Denny and Phil have also uh, touched on, uh, again, are, are these partnerships that need to be struck between rural and urban America. And the depth of leadership, the depth of leadership is going to be needed in order to do that. Uh, I would also say as a sidebar, we need to get more broadband. It's complicated into those parts of rural America that don't have it in order to make telehealth even feasible, right? So my message at this point is there's no silver bullet. We need to work on multiple fronts at the same time. And we need to do this in a spirit of collaboration and listening to each other and building on each other's thoughts, ideas, and actions. And I think with that, Phil, I'll turn it back to you and we'll progress from there. Thank you very much. And certainly we wanna hear from the listeners too, if they have questions, because we wanna address them and make sure we uh, give enough time to have uh, their thoughts and feel that we're listening to one and all. Um, the challenges are, as we go through this, and let me just throw it back to the two of you to have short sort of a point specific thoughts on is where are we gonna get this next uh, generation of leadership from? Is it going to come out of the uh, technical schools? Is it going to come out of the 4-H? Is it going to come out of where, where's it going to come from? And are there the resources there? Because from my opinion, it's my perspective, it's very hierarchical. It's not from the bottom up, it's from the top down. And when we talk about health, we seem to get start, uh, caught in a silo of health and health care or illness care. We don't realize the cross sector that's needed dealing with transportation, economics, housing, and you keep going on. So we got to bring these people together so they're all at the same table and the different levels of leadership, whether it's at the local level, the state level, the national level. And they seem to, when I was in Washington recently, then I put it back in your court, is what they were talking about is mainly problems and going back to the old model of Hilburton and paying hospitals, rural hospitals that are a model of the past. Then they spend all the time 
on now talking about telehealth, which is a great story, but in what we're hearing about, they don't talk about it from the person or the consumer point of view. They talk about it primarily from the physicians, not even the nurse practitioner's point of view, the pharmacist's point of view. And the number one issue is payment reimbursement. How are they going to get paid? And the other thing that's interesting is younger people use text as the form of telehealth. Uh, those who are slightly older use audio because it's cheaper and easier. And then the older people are beginning to use telemedicine with the help of their family. So I just turn this back to you to address the issue of how we're going to get the next generation. Because as you look at this screen now, we see three very attractive senior men, right? So we got to make this a much more diverse picture for those who are looking at us. Thanks, Phil. I, I would call us old white men as well. So I, the, the question of leadership is a, a fabulous thing to think about. And I think part of the problem is if you don't understand what's going on in rural America, you'll never understand that there's actually a leadership model out there that would work, I believe, nationwide. And the reason I think it'll work nationwide is that it is relational in its basis. You have to have a relationship in order to be classified as a leader, be accepted as a leader, and to lead. The, the challenge that we've got is, I think all of us are counting to one degree or another on the youth of America to step forward as the Parkland group did when there were those mass shootings. Well, they are operating on a different paradigm than what most of us are operating on. So I think we basically have to come up with a new frame. We have to come up with a new paradigm in order to help everybody in our society understand that they can lead. I mean, <laughs> the, the real challenge for me has always been, because I, I deal, I've dealt my entire life with relationships, on a scale of one to 10, I ask my people that I'm working with, how much are you willing to risk for me? If you're not willing to risk a one on a 10 point scale, I don't think we can have a relationship and we can't function very well, which means then we are still leaderless. So the issue of trust and accountability for me, it's all and tied of course with relationship is really what leadership is all about. And Stephen, and we also have a question that I want to I, pose to you shortly. Yeah, oh. I'll just add to what uh, what Denny has said. I, I think, Phil, there's going to be multiple sources of leadership. It's not any one source, and it begins in the family, and it begins with a sense of efficacy and confidence in your life and your potential and the opportunities uh, that you have. And it, it's the style of leadership that involves the relationships, empowerment, and this whole idea of a sense of agency, everyone uh, has leadership potential within them. You're not born with it. It's a matter of stepping up and speaking with confidence uh, and taking some chances and being supported by the key figures in your life, uh, your parents, those school teachers, et cetera, the friends that you develop. And so it has to come from the bottom up, absolutely not from the top down, and not from any single source. Well, excellent response. So here's our first question I'd like to share with you, um, and then we'll go from there. Someone uh, wrote in, we don't have a health care system. We have a disease system. Are the community centers, city centers, houses of worship, and city town officials providing support for wellness? For example, free exercise classes, nutrition, group meetings for community support, group meetings for parents. And I guess that would tie into a follow-on from my own self. How do we tell bright stories? There are examples throughout the country. There's a community center in West Virginia that's doing very good on this issue. There's a place in the state of Washington. There's places in Nebraska. But how do we share uh, the stories so people learn by them, see them, hear them? And then how do we get them to uh, address more the prevention of illness, not just the chronic illness state? Let me start out with that one, Phil, and then Denny, I'm sure we'll add on. I'll give a concrete example. It's exactly what we've been talking about uh, in terms of uh, how health is produced. And so a concrete example is in uh, Humboldt County, Northern California. They have 20 what they call family resource centers. 
in our community health center, family resource centers. They're an example maybe of the term that I've used, whole person development centers. And they target all members of the community. They pool the funding streams in advance. So you get rid of the silos of the budget. It's my budget, you know, I can't afford it. I'm subsidized. No, they pool them in advance, okay? And they have what I will call a backbone organization that holds people accountable and responsible. And again, Denny's point about lack of anonymity, you see each other every day, by God, you know, you gotta be accountable, right? And so they've developed a common vision, a common goal, strategies, mm -hmm. uh, they're sharing data, and it's kind of uh, being evaluated by the uh, California Center for Rural Policy at Humboldt State, Nordisk California Center for Rural Policy, not health policy per se, so that's an example of uh, the question that's been asked. But your point, Phil, how do we accelerate and spread more of that across the country? The, and then, again, again, part of the challenge is that all of the models that we come up with were designed to collect money. And if money is collection is the primary focus, we're going to end up with these continuation of silos. In healthcare, most of it right now, given what's going on with COVID, et cetera, is focused on hospitals. Well, if, if you're in a state with not very many hospitals, or you got a whole bunch of hospitals that are in trouble, uh, you you should be really concerned, and rightly so. I I mean, this is going to sound strange, but for from about 1990 on, I, I asked rural citizens and also rural policymakers at the state level, uh, couldn't we consider allowing veterinarians to deliver some primary care in frontier counties? I have 33 of them in the, of the 93 in Nebraska. Well, that that could never be a reality as long as you were stuck in a, a vision or a paradigm or a frame that says, well, they're veterinarians, they deal with animals. Well, if you give a veterinarian an AED, they basically are a, a mobile physician office. So that's just one example. The other, the other challenge that, that rural has is that most of the stuff, the, the designs that we have that we're operating on actually came out of the military. So if you think about uh, the Hilburton hospitals, those were basically MASH hospitals. If you watch MASH on TV, that's what a Hilburton hospital was. I have 65 of them in my state. They all became critical asset access hospitals instead. We have mid-levels, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, assisted, uh, whatever title we want to give them. Those actually were military models because we had military people coming back who were medics and they wanted to continue to work. We have transport. Transport was a big deal in the military and it became a big deal for us. And so the EMS, which started in the 60s and 70s, came about from the military model. And now we've got telecommunication, which is also a military model. I, I think the challenge is this, this whole idea of imprinting, or I would say where you're birthed, it, it really is a high determinant on what you're going to become. So specifically, you're right. We don't have a healthcare system. We have, we have bits and pieces of silos. Uh, we have huge amounts of vertical in, uh, integration going on. We have five or six large hospital systems in the whole country. We have about that many uh, health insurance companies. Well, there's no competition, if you believe in competition. There's, it's very hard to get those five or six biggies to sit down, as Steve is suggesting, and create something that's in common. So, you know, I think the idea of a local health council, uh, a regional health council, where some of Steve's ideas could be put into place. Uh, I have for years suggested that what we need is a not-for-profit health co-op insurance plan owned by we the people of the United States. That's a pretty hard paradigm shift, but I think it, all of this seems more possible now because of, of the challenges that we're facing and what we're struggling to overcome. So I don't know that I answered the question, but I think you gotta look at the, the silos that were created to deliver money. Fair enough. And there was another question that Jess was posed to us about, are the hospitals actually closing because of revenue? Yes, they are closing for revenue. The question is, are they been well managed? 
Do they have a model that meets the needs of the community? And as they go forward, here are a couple of little facts for people to think about. The total budget for healthcare in the United States is over $3 trillion. It's about 18 to 19% of the gross domestic product. Of that $3 trillion, less than 3% is spent on public health. So it's divided more into illness care. Very little is reimbursed for preventive care. And with that, over the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, there was a, a downturn of public health uh, act, uh, players, uh, stakeholders of 50,000. And on top of that, you might find it hard to believe that only 43% of the people who hold chief executive jobs in hospitals in rural America have ever held that position before. Right. So we're going into a different model now. We're going to have to look for different models or have to look for different payment models or have to do collaboration. Someone said, "Would I? could I move from UCSF where the health care is good to rural Northern California? And the issue is you have to make sure there's maybe a better partnership between UCSF and Humboldt County, whatever it is. We saw that at the school I'm associated with Stanford where they were trying to create these collaborative efforts and there's still room for improvement from the academic centers to the more rural centers. So with that, I would ask Stephen, what do you think about the future model? Because right now they're bringing in drones for care in rural America, like they did in Rwanda. They're bringing in different types of uh, specialty care coming in on a monthly basis from an urban center into a rural center. Uh, so there are new models evolving. Your thoughts on what you would think is the hybrid new model? Yeah, well, I think we need to accelerate those models uh, that you mentioned, Phil, in terms of the academic medical centers with rural America and also some of these health systems as well that have a lot of their hospitals in rural America. Uh, one of the examples of innovation that has occurred in the last few years in terms of uh, how to better deliver healthcare now in rural America is to recognize the importance of, uh, of something that Caravan, for example, a company that's aggregated about a hundred or so rural hospitals would have a hard time making it on their own uh, and developing a population health nurse. Notice the title, a population health nurse that works with the local primary care physician there if there is one. And you need resources, you need revenue, okay? And they help that rural health provider make sure they get the revenue in, in terms of some of the coding that needs to be done. But more importantly, they invest in prevention that you mentioned, Phil, and in wellness, okay? And by getting to the people in rural America that have some of these issues developing, they try to nip them in the bud and keep that person in the rural community such that if they do need to be hospitalized, they can do it in that small rural hospital, critical access hospital, whatever it might be. My added suggestion reinforces yours. There needs to then be the specialty backup of a healthcare team that, that makes no sense to have located physically in rural America, but has to be there in the urban medical centers or the urban health systems. And this is where I think telehealth, and it will it has to get paid for exactly right. You have to create the incentives for it because people do have to make money. We're in a capitalistic society. You need to pay nurses and others living wages, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to have the technology to make it available, make sure these partnerships are easier to put together. And I think with the advent and the visibility now of telehealth is one example of that, you can begin to bring in the specialty care to keep people in the rural community, just like the example I gave earlier. You know, I think that's appropriate. Denny, you have a word you want to say? We well, also would like to hear a little bit about the issue of Nutrition, how important is nutrition in one's health? I think it's critically important uh, to add to the total well-being. Let me speak to the hospital issue as quickly as I can. Um, yes, hospitals are closing. Why are they closing? Well, up until there was a critical access hospital model, there were only two models. You either were long-term care or you were a regular hospital. So whether you lived, you were in rural or if you were in urban LA, it didn't make any difference. You had to follow the same guidelines. But what, what happened is, of course, we, we had lots of inflexibility, and that was all held inflexible because we had payment models. 
So what's happened in rural? In many cases, we've had population loss. So even though they got the best reimbursement, they don't have the people coming through the door. We have issues of urbanization of America, in my opinion, which has created a lifestyle situation for some of our medical students, et cetera. The other reality, especially for going into rural practice, or basically any practice, is that primary education for a primary care doctor and even advanced practice nurse, mid-levels, whatever, is very expensive. And so they're coming out with huge amounts of debt, and so they're going to go where the biggest dollar is. And so we, we have to face that issue. The issue of broadband, wonderful, except we don't have a nationwide system that can handle the type of broadband that we need, and therefore we cannot provide the health type of services that, that Steve and uh, it's beginning to envision. So we either have to go with a public utility model in my mind, or we have to reinstitute an REA, rural electrification model, which was the great unifier and leveler in our society in the, in the past. So are they closing? Yeah, they're closing, mostly because the infl in, uh, flexibility and the lack of innovation in the payment models that, that would work for small rural entities. Let me just add a couple more, because if you look at the uh, challenges facing the delivery system, you have the persistent ones, which you already mentioned, the low volume, the patient payer mixed. You have the recent models with the payments. How are we going to get paid? And Steve addressed that. What's a better way to move on from fee for service to value to uh, globalization? And then you have the emergent ones, and it showed up again with the COVID-19. Uh, it showed up heavily, which you haven't heard too much about, the opiate and amphetamine, methamphetamine addiction that's highly prevalent in rural America, a high rate of suicides, especially amongst the youth. You have the medical surge capacity. So what happens when you get the COVID-19 out of the meat processing or you have a flood or whatever it is? These hospitals can't hold the basis of what they need. You also have a significant amount of violence in a lot of these rural communities for one reason or another. And if you look at the COVID thing, it shows out how desperation the, na the Native Americans are for better health delivery system. It's just not there. You see the processing plants with the migrants, how desperate their situation is. You see the nursing homes closing. So that's it. And then, to be honest with you, now you have the whole modern day issue of cyber threats to these rural uh, health institutions. So the data is being stolen both from the health delivery system and the people. So we got some challenges, but I think what's more important in the time we have is uh, looking forward to the solutions because you can talk problems at late. Um, my thoughts are we have to have more conversations. We have to have more discussion groups where a variety of different players are engaged. We have to get people from uh, the community involved. We have to get the local leadership involved. We have to create some public-private partnerships with business communities, bringing them in. We have to relate to the farmers community. We can't just stay as siloed as health deliverers or providers or hospital executives. So that's one thing. Two, whether it's right or wrong, I think there's a role for a, a cross-sector task force to come together where people seriously come together, heard, and come up with a working agenda of deliverables with definable objectives and key results and metrics to uh, define this. So I think with this and use the innovative thinking and innovative technology to do it. So that's my thought. I think that if you can share with us what your thoughts are as far as what you would like to have takeaways for the audience that are sort of what they can share with their colleagues, their family, and likes that are... Um, on the uphill, not on the downhill slope. Steve, go ahead. Okay, I think, uh, Phil, you've teed up uh, a lot there, and I'll uh, highlight maybe three or four things very quickly. Uh, one, uh, what you've said in many respects is what some people call health in all policies, health in all policies. That could be the agenda for your task force, for example. And uh, uh, what I mean by that uh, is educational policy, transportation policy, housing policy, they all affect health much more than that rural hospital does, and much more, in fact, than that rural provider does. And so when those institutions are about 
planning what they're going to do with their resources, their strategic priorities. Where is health on that agenda? It has to be a part of that conversation. Uh, we need to think of ways of grabbing people's attention. How do you grab people's attention? Broadband's a challenge. You know, Denny's mentioned that. Okay, fine. What are we going to do about it? That can be changed. Let's talk about the public-private partnership or the utility model. It's going to change it. We need broadband, right? Okay. So let's remove the barriers. Okay, let's talk about that. So that would be my first point. My second point on the delivery system itself, I think we're on the way, and maybe now the COVID and the structural racism in this country that we've seen for decades, but highlighted the past week or two, will finally push us over the top in terms of recognizing the perversity of the way in which we pay for healthcare instead of health in this country, and universal coverage, however we can bring that about. Universal coverage, basic set, et cetera, uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, Nick Kristoff and his co-author have a book out called Tightrope, and he just documents rural Oregon he grew up with. Almost every kid he went to the bus, uh, to the school bus with, ended up with opioid alcoholism, in prison, early death, what have you, for a variety of reasons, variety of reasons. Their parents didn't have health insurance coverage, didn't have role models, uh, didn't complete high school, et cetera, et cetera. So the health is a part of these other kinds of policies. So I think that would be probably my, my second point. And my third point, uh, just to uh, uh, underscore, uh, you know, racism really is about the systematic way in which we structure opportunity in this country. Dr. Kamara Jones at Harvard has uh, spoken eloquently about this. So you talk about rural America and the inequities and inequalities Talk about the racism of black rural America uh, and black America in general in parts of our country. And it has to do with the systematic way in which we've denied opportunities to people in this country uh, discriminately. And it's no surprise that COVID-19 therefore has affected disproportionately uh, our people of color in this country and it's a disgrace and I think hopefully we've had another wake up call that will lead to some action uh, that can be sustained over time, but it's gonna be a marathon. We have to start now, it's gonna be a marathon. Every day, every day. I'll just end there for now. Thank you. Denny? Um, I'd like to see some real stories, not the negative ones, not the negative paradigms, the negative frames, et cetera, that, that are being tossed out. We need local media to finally step up. And it's very difficult for them because it's hard for them to survive given what's going on. Uh, when I had my newspaper, I basically had a simple model that said, we're the community uh, speaking to itself. Uh, that needs to be done. We need a huge paradigm shift. You've heard me talk about it. I really believe a spider web model would, would work. It would link together many of the things that the three of us have been talked about. Um, I'd like to see a 51% rule. I've talked about this for many years, and that is any decision that involves rural people, rural communities, rural areas, 51% of the people sitting around the table making the decision must come from those communities in that rural way of life. I think in order to have a broadband model that works, we're probably gonna have to do the REA model from the past. It was the great equalizer then, and I think broadband is the great equalizer now. We need to ask the question, who can deliver care? Uh, you, you've heard me talk about the military models. We, we're basically flooded with urban models, which really don't work well in rural America. We need to figure out how to allow people to deliver care in the places where they live and work. Transportation may be getting cheaper, it may not. It really doesn't make any difference. If, if you have a single model for anything, it's only gonna work in single places. We need to do a better job of asset mapping. The tools are out there, rural communities need to use it, urban communities need to look at it and use it also. And the bottom line for me is that it's time for all of us to begin to invest. You should be investing in the community you're present living in. You should invest in the community that you grew up in. And if you got additional resources of whatever, 
you ought to you ought to uh, invest in the places where your parents either live now or have lived. We need to trust each other. We need to be accountable to each other. Thank you. Well, let me give you a couple more little bullets so people can reflect on it. There are also some other questions of where does pharma fit into the equation. We certainly have to deal a little bit better with regulations of what's advertised on TV, whether it's value added or not. How do we deal with the costs and all that? And make sure that's part of what Steve was talking about, the universal health delivery system. You have to bring in pharma. It was not brought into HCA, the Affordable Care Act. They were on the side. And keep in mind, if we talked about the quadruple equation, better health, better care, lower cost, and person satisfaction, we really have to find ways to doing it. In my way of looking going forward, we really do have to make sure that we have trusted and transparent data on these issues to pull the people together. We have to identify and uplift the bright spots. So when we have a story, whether it's Humboldt County that Steve raised or what Denny raised here, we gotta hear those stories. We gotta hear them from the bottom up out and try to find the hybrid between the bottom up and the top down. We have to develop unprecedented collaboration. So we do have to come in. And if you look at that, I have what I call the five C's. We have to convene people. We have to connect people. We have to communicate amongst ourselves. We have to collaborate. And the strongest C is we have to make commitments. This can't be words uh, matter, but action matters more. And research is critically important, but let's put research into action, not just more research to monitor. We have to build an, a sustainable and diverse workforce that caters to the particular location because rural America is rural America, but each part of rural America has its own culture, its own ethnicity, its own politics and what's like. So one model doesn't fit at all. So you have to build on it. And in essence, also, I think there's a great role for the community uh, care worker to be out there more so. Not everything has to be provided by the physician or by the specialist at the higher level. It can be provided by the marital counselor. We definitely need more mental health there. And we have to use the right tools for the right reasons. So telehealth is on its way. It's definitely part of the new delivery system. But we have to make sure it can be trusted, it's paid correctly, and that the patients are not only seen as patients, but they're seen as persons and consumers. So we can get something that's holistic in its orientation that deals with the physical, the mental, and the social well-being. So with that, I'd like to uh, see if there are any other questions and I'd like to uh, bring in our friend Robbie when he feels uh, he wants to come back in to share with what we're at and give his short perspective. Robbie was the one who invited us to this, who's critically important to the healthy society and is an innovator in his own thought process. So, Robbie, welcome aboard. I know this is not what you normally do, but we consider you part of the family. Thank you, Phil. Um, you know, I mean, I learned a lot. Each of you brought, I think, very different um, perspectives to the question. Um, you know, when Denny was talking about the need for um, stories, uh, positive stories, I, I was just thinking of, of the images, you know, that I was raised with as a kid. I was raised in rural California uh, in a town of 3,000 people, kind of at the end of a Steinbeckian uh, California. And, uh, you know, you could hear the trains at night and there were orchards everywhere in Northern California and that, that world's gone now. But, you know, it seems like since most Americans live in cities and suburbs now, and most movies and TV shows are all about city life, I think that there's a complete misunderstanding of, of what uh, the real rural, rural world looks like. And, you know, I think apart from driving through it on freeways, Highway 5 here in California, I think people don't know anything about it. So anything that brings the reality of, of the life of, of the towns and the farms and the people forward, I think would be positive because I, <laughs> I think that's missing. And I think that's a challenge for all three of you as a separate issue from all the analytics. Uh, Denny and uh, Steve, why don't we uh, come up with our uh, closure of feelings and then we'll move on and turn it back over to Robbie to uh, say we're right on schedule. Well, my closing is pretty much what I've, what I've said before is uh, 
despite the sometimes doom, doom and gloom which we may have presented, in 2018, we finally crossed the line of losing population in rural America. We actually gained in 2019 684,000 above the losses in, in rural. So that, that change is happening. It's, going to, it's coming about for lots of different reasons, but there's new people coming in. The challenge for rural and urban and whoever these people are that are moving in is that you have to understand the anonymity issue. You have to be willing to operate on very, with very close relationships. And you have to identify and allow leaders on whatever the issue is that needs to be addressed, allow them to come forward, nurture them, encourage them, and, and get to work. Uh, as, as Phil said, it isn't just a matter of creating a vision. It's a matter of putting action to that. Otherwise, a vision is just a dream. So I'm, I'm actually very optimistic right now about what can happen in rural America, what can actually happen with the healthcare system. But there are so many forces that don't want change to come about. It's gonna take most of us working on these big issues together in order to really bring it about. So I encourage everybody to do that. And I encourage you, as I said before, you need to invest. We need investment right now uh, in order to make whether it's urban or rural, probably really doesn't make any difference, but rural really needs new investment for the many changes that, that need to come about. And Stephen, and then I'll yeah. make a few words before I turn it over to Robbie. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, I guess it's been said, never waste a crisis. So <laughs> let's not be asleep. Never waste a crisis. I would just reiterate, Phil, health in all policies, health in all policies. Also, realistically, we have to recognize that all the forces that may be opposing the changes that we've talked about this evening, we need to be creative and think and do differently, think and do differently, not more of the same, as to how we bring them to the table. We have to engage their self-interest. We have to engage their self-interest. We can't convince them that, oh, you know, to our ideas, every the world would be better off if there were more money in rural health, you know, et cetera. But what is their own self-interest? How are they going to be hurt where they can't fulfill their strategic priorities or dreams unless they see the interdependency with what's needed in rural America as well as urban America? So we have to understand and have that kind of leadership that engages the force again some of the progress that we have a golden opportunity now. Never waste a crisis. <laughs> well, I would agree with you. And before I turn it over to Robbie, I'd like just to have a little repetition. That's what I learned in the public health service. Repetition's okay. At the start of this conversation, we talked about two sets of key words, change, transformation, leadership. We need them right now defined by others in many different ways. And two, we need to take this energy into a collaborative approach between our policies, our politics, and our practicalities. Because without getting these three Ps integrated, we just get more words and we don't get action. So I do believe, like Stephen and uh, Denny said, there is a spirit of optimism, a spirit of hope, a spirit of of just a spirit, and we need the positive energies to make this happen. And maybe we start with pilot projects, and we uh, grow the pilot projects, and we're not going to have a universal change overnight. So each community can empower itself for what its needs are, and then share their stories and lesson learns with other communities. So with that, I can't thank the Commonwealth Club and its membership for inviting us here. I can't thank Denny and Stephen and my colleagues and friends for what they've done. And let me turn it back to you, Robbie, for a final word. Thank you, Phil. So if you came in late, uh, I'm Robbie Kilpatrick, Chair of the Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum at the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco. I'd like to thank uh, Philip Polakoff, Phil, uh, Denny, Dennis Behrens, and Steve Shortell our speakers for tonight's incredibly informative discussion about how to create a healthier America as part of our Healthy Society series. 
I really looked forward to look to hearing more about the national task force to find solutions, gentlemen. And I also thank you, our audience, for participating today. In a few days' time, the video of this program will be available at no charge on the club's website, and you can feel free to send it to anyone you want in the world. For 117 years, the Commonwealth Club of California has supported enlightened discussion. We welcome you to check out our programs on the website at www.commonwealthclub.org. Membership is open to all and donations are welcome. Thank you and good night. <laughs>